So uh, we live in a, a sex saturated culture, and it seems obvious that romance and sex provide the most powerful, vital and fulfilling aspects of human living to most people. By comparison, non-sexual friendship can seem either weak and unimportant or even potentially abusive. Yet the Bible celebrates committed covenantal friendship. How can we reimagine gospel-shaped friendship in the sexually obsessed and suspicious world in which we live? What are the red flags that indicate when a friendship is going wrong? And how can we create healthy Christian communities in which friendships can flourish? Professor John Wyatt is Emeritus Professor of Neonatal Pediatrics at the University College London and a senior lecturer at the Faraday Institute in Cambridge, and also president of the UK Christian Medical Fellowship, which is ICMDA's UK affiliate. John's got a clinical background as a pediatrician caring for sick and premature infants, and also as a medical scientist researching into the prevention of brain injury in newborn babies. He's always been interested in ethical dilemmas raised by advances in medical technology, and he's frequently engaged in public and professional consultations and debates from the perspective of the Christian faith. His book, uh, probably his best known book, Matters of Life and Death, Human Dilemmas in the Light of the Christian Faith, has been translated into more than 10 languages and well known to ICMDA members. John's most recent book, however, is on transforming friendship. And uh, that's more the subject that we're going to be looking at today. He and his wife, Celia, are longstanding members of All Souls Church in London. John, it's just a pleasure to have you back again. Thank you so much for joining us again on ICMBA webinars. We really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. It's a, it's a joy to be here. And I see many familiar friends in the attendees list. So I want to talk about friendship. It's a, it's a, it's a topic which has been very much on my heart. Intergenerational friendship in particular is what I'm, I'm really concerned to, to talk about and to, um, to try to uh, say why I think this is so important. A God-given means for growing disciples of Jesus. So the problem straight away is that in English, there's a problem with the English language because the word friend and the whole idea of friendship has become very contaminated, misleading, and even unhelpful in my, in my view. Uh, we all understand that there is a, a continuous spectrum of relationships from somebody that we, just a superficial acquaintance, all the way through to the kind of phrases that we might talk about as a soulmate or a, a blood brother. And of course, it's now become much more complicated again by the whole concept of a social media friend or being unfriended or whatever. So, so the word is, is really complex and, and difficult. And I want to talk particularly about friendship between Christian people of different generations, and which is at the close end of the spectrum. It's, it's committed, it's intimate, it's reciprocal, two-way, it's focused on the gospel and it's life transformative. And the reason I want to talk about this is because I had the astonishing privilege of, of having a number of relationships like this. As a young man, there were a number of older people who reached out to me. And in particular, uh, John Stott, the well-known uh, preacher, teacher, and writer uh, of the 20th century, uh, reached out to me. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that friendship. But r w the reason I'm so passionate about this topic is, is that the friendship I had with John Stott, which lasted 30 years, we walked together, that friendship transformed my life. It, it, it changed me as a person. It redirected me. It gave me new uh, a vision of what it meant to serve Christ. And, and to be honest, sp speaking at a human level, the main reason why I'm here doing what I'm doing now and being involved with ICMDA and with Christian Medical Fellowship and so on is because of what John Stott modeled for me as a young man. And although rich, transformative friendships across the generations, it used to be a common feature of Christian churches and communities. I, I, I was brought up in a, um, 
in a, in a church family where I thought it was completely normal that I had all these older, quote, aunties and uncles, people who cared about me and who loved me and who told me they were praying for me and were interested in my life. Um, but those kind of relationships seem to be much less common now in churches. And in particular, the idea that an older man might reach out uh, to a younger person and, and want to develop a friendship with them, uh, an intimate, a close, a committed friendship. To many people, modern ears, that sounds weird, suspicious, and, and even creepy. And I think it's helpful to, to understand a bit about why friendships have become uh, suspicious, why, why we're cautious. And there's this useful phrase, the hermeneutic of suspicion. Hermeneutics is a technical word meaning the interpretation of documents. So we often talk about biblical hermeneutics. Um, but and, and what's developed is the hermeneutics of suspicion. Um, and this is the idea that you never read a text, a written document, just to take the surface meaning. You have to dig down and see what, what's being concealed, what, what's, what's the subplot here. Don't just believe the surface, dig down to understand what's going on behind. And the same kind of thing happens with friendship. So instead of saying, um, just seeing what's on the surface, oh, isn't it nice? Those two people, they seem to spend a lot of time together. Immediately we're saying, hang on a minute, what's going on here? You know, is this sexual? Is this a power play? You know, things can't just be what they appear to be on the surface. And historically, these three big figures, Marx, Freud and Nietzsche, have been described as the masters of suspicion. Marx said you had to look for the economic power relations that were, that's the important thing. Freud said, no, no, it's all about sex. And Nietzsche says, no, it's about power. And um, so behind this idea, therefore, is that whenever there's a really strong relationship, a deep and intermittent, committed relationship, it must be to do with sex and power. Um, and, and that deep suspicion, corroding suspicion, it is a feature of the modern world. And in particular, our culture has become intensely sexualized and sexually obsessed. And I think this is a very profound statement from Malcolm Muggeridge, the journalist, who said once that sex is the mysticism of the materialist. In other words, if you're a materialist and you just believe that in the end there's nothing apart from physics and stuff, then you have to rule out all kinds of spiritual, numinous experiences. So, so what are you left with? Or what's the most powerful emotion that a materialist may discover? And answer, well, it's sex and it, it's orgasm. It's, it's, it's sexual longing and attraction. And so this then becomes the source of meaning. It's the mysticism because that's that's all that's left once I've ruled out all the religious, the spiritual, the cultural, other factors. And I'm afraid I'm increasingly convinced that modern evangelical churches have also unwittingly bought into the sexual obsession of our times. It's striking to me that if you hear a church is putting on um, a session for young people about relationships, that's code for sex and romance, because what else is there? What other kind of relationships are important? So the implicit message that the church is giving is, is that sex and romance and marriage, these are the most important things in life. And instead, what is being downplayed is the central importance of healthy, committed, intimate, but non-sexual friendships and how these are such a source of uh, stability, guidance, uh, and they, are, they can be truly transformative. But unfortunately, uh, we have had over the last decade, a whole series of terrible scandals um, to do with abusive uh, Christian leaders. And I just want to say that it's very likely that some people listening to this podcast or watching the video uh, have also um, had those kind of experiences 
that 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 they some you know have had a painful experience in the past of abusive um, people within the church and, and so I want to recognize that this is this is a deeply painful uh, topic which leaves very long lasting scars but we've had the names of Ravi Zacharias Mark Driscoll um, John Smythe Dave Fletcher Jonathan Fletcher sorry um, Steve Timmis and Jean Vanier um, with the Lash community what What's fascinating and tragic is that really it's almost like every single branch of the modern church, evangelicals, liberal, Protestants, Catholics, reformed, and so on, every single branch has been uh, touched by these scandals. So what do these people have in common? Well, the first thing to say is that they're all men, and I'm afraid all the evidence is that men are much more likely to be abusers than women. It could, abuse can happen with women, but it's less common. And all these men were powerful, influential, trusted and respected church leaders. They were impressive, they were charming, they were persuasive, they were biblically knowledgeable, they were apparently spiritual and godly. But what we now know is that in reality there were some deep, hidden, psychological and emotional needs and brokenness that led these leaders to become predatory on vulnerable individuals. They abused the trust that people put in them. And in this horrific image, which actually Jesus talked about, if you, the idea that a poor defenseless sheep comes along to the flock and at last, here's there a man and he looks to be a shepherd. Here's someone who's going to look after me and guide me. And yet the terrible reality is instead of being a shepherd, this is a wolf and feeding and devouring on the vulnerable sheep. So these men use their spiritual and psychological authority to gratify hidden needs for coercion, control, manipulation, abuse and sexual gratification. And it's understandable, therefore, that many people have said, because of these scandals, we just have to sort of back off. We, it's too dangerous. I've heard Christian leaders, particularly older male Christian leaders, say, I, I just, it's too dangerous. I can't develop any close friendships um, with younger people because immediately I will be accused of, of being predatory, abusive, and so on. But I think if, if we allow this hermeneutic of suspicion, to mean that we don't develop these friendships, then we're allowing evil to triumph. So in comparison, it strikes me how friendship is actually a common theme in the Bible, but it is one that has been surprisingly overlooked. When I first wanted to write a book about friendship from a Christian and biblical point of view, I thought to myself, what I need to find is some really big tomes about a friendship in, in the Hebrew scriptures or friendship in the Bible. So I can see what theologians and scholars have said about friendship. And to my utter astonishment, I found it almost impossible to find any serious writing about friendships in the last 50 years from Bible scholars. And when I compared that with the, the volumes of theological debate and, and volumes that have been written about sex and sexuality and marriage, I was just, again, astonished by how friendship has been um, undervalued. And in fact, you have to go back to previous eras of Christian writers in order to see people who really took friendship seriously. And yet, deep, intimate, intimate committed, loving, but non-sexual friendships have always been at the heart of Christian living and a primary means of Christian discipleship. And in the Old Testament, friendship crops up in, in many different places. There are two model or paradigm friendships, uh, David and Jonathan and Ruth and Naomi. And just starting with Ruth and Naomi, uh, I haven't time to, to go into detail into the story. I recommend you to read the book of Ruth again because it's such a beautiful picture of friendship between an older woman and a younger woman. And it, it's clear that Although Ruth was 
was Naomi's daughter-in-law. Um, she'd been widowed and uh, Naomi said to Ruth, um, she released her from her familial uh, duties. Uh, she said, go back to your own people. Uh, you don't need to care for me. I release you from your duties. But Ruth replies to Naomi this surprising and remarkable statement. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. And so what we see is that this was not a familial duty. It was a voluntary a covenant commitment on both sides. And fascinatingly, their friendship between two widows who you remember in Israeli society, the widows were absolutely at the bottom of the pile in terms of social significance. And yet the scriptures celebrate this interracial and intergenerational friendship. And they cling to one another in an intensely both practical but emotional and spiritual way. It affects every aspect of their life and it lasts to the grave and beyond. And of course, what is so wonderful about this friendship is it has a key role in salvation history. Ruth, from the hated Moabite pagan race, enters into the Davidic line. And, and literally, it seems that Jesus has Ruth's genes in him. And it all happens because of the unexpected, interracial, intergenerational, intimate and loyal friendship between two women. And then you've got David and Jonathan. And again, it's interesting that you know, as I studied David and Jonathan, I realized this too was in, to some extent inter intergenerational. So Jonathan is in his, at least in his mid thirties, approaching 40. He's absolutely the peak of his uh, prestige. He's the heir to the throne. He's an accomplished warrior. He has an incredibly high status as number two in the land. And David is somewhere between 16 and 18. And he's a son of a peasant family. And he's just uh, killed Goliath using what could be seen as a, as a cheap peasant's trick. And yet, some chemistry between them, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own brother. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made, and the literal Hebrew is cut, a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and bow and belt. And yet Jonathan knew that David was a real threat to his own life because David was, had been named as the next king of, of Israel after, after Saul. And the, and the normal practice when someone became king was that they would slaughter all the family of the deposed king. Uh, and yet Jonathan takes his armor, his sword, and he hands it over to David, to this usurper, and says, I will defend you to the end. And so there's, there's mutual attraction, there's joy, there's tears, there's generosity, there's self-sacrifice, there's, there's spiritual upbuilding. And interestingly, this, this relationship between David and Jonathan is described with this wonderful Hebrew word hesed, which means covenant love or loyal love. And uh, it was used normally about God and his God's faithfulness and his promises. Now, what's really sad to me is that any sermon today about David and Jonathan, the preacher seems to be able, have to spend half the sermon arguing that this is not a homosexual relationship. Um, interestingly, I tried to look back to see whether any previous commentators or writers had ever had that suggestion. And none of them, it's not there. It does, it's only until after Freud that any Bible commentary, it occurs to them that it could possibly be a homosexual relationship. It would be laughable to any other generation. 
that David and Jonathan could have a homosexual relationship. And yet, again, we're so sexually obsessed now, we find it incredible to believe that two men could have this passionate relationship, which wasn't sexual. Fast forwarding very rapidly to the, um, the New Testament, and, and is the example of Jesus. And because this word friend has become so devalued, this passage in John 15, I no longer call you servants, Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. That verse has lost its astonishing power because in the traditional rabbi's relationship with his disciples, he would then would know what no rabbi would have dreamed of causing his disciples friends. That would be completely inappropriate. But Jesus deliberately subverts this traditional rabbi's role by entering into intimate friendship with his disciples. But Christ-like friendship is framed not just with love and joy and intimacy, but also in terms of sacrifice, of giving and supporting the other. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And then there's Paul and Timothy. And I do think this is where we're getting into, particularly into generational friendship. I haven't time to unpick the relationship between Paul and Timothy. I do do more in the in the book, um, but it's clear that this was a deep, deep reciprocal friendship. Paul had chosen Timothy, but the relationship was intensely personal and heartfelt, and loving and affectionate. Uh, Paul calls Timothy my own child in the Lord. And yet it's really interesting that he also clearly had very close relationships with Titus and also with Onesimus, the runaway slave, who, he, who says to Philemon, I'm sending you back Onesimus, sending you my, uh, my own heart itself. So, so Paul had these very intense emotional relationships with, with many younger men. It's interesting how he encourages and exhorts Timothy, but there's very little rebuke or harsh criticism. He shares his heart. He talks about his own failings and his own fears of his sense of abandonment. He makes himself vulnerable to, to, to Timothy. And there is this lifelong, reciprocal, practical, prayerful friendship between Paul and Timothy. And astonishingly, I had the privilege of a similar kind of relationship with John Stott, as did many other young men. Uh, he had a ministry of friendship, which was carried out privately. Uh, he never spoke about it. He never talked about it, never wrote about it. And yet it was one of his principal means of ministry, reaching out to young people and developing um, these kind of friendships. And um, as I said before, this friendship with, with John Stott transformed my life as he shared his heart. He made himself vulnerable. Uh, to me, he, he shared some of the struggles he had as a single man um, and the temptations that he'd been open to. Uh, he asked me to pray for him. He asked my advice about various things. Um, and at the same time, he, he prayed for me. He cared for me, advised me. He walked with me. Uh, he introduced me to some of his other friends and, and colleagues. And uh, there are many people around the world who had the privilege of this kind of deep friendship with John Stott. And I was talking to a friend of mine who I'd met through John Stott called David Zak Niringea, a bishop in Uganda. And we were talking about John Stott and I said, you know, how would you characterize the friendship you had with John Stott? And he said, John, it was a friendship carved out of the heart of the gospel. And so I thought that concept of a gospel shaped friendship is such a helpful idea. And I've tried to list some of the characteristics I see about gospel shaped friendship. I haven't time to unpack all these again. Um, they'll be available in the P I'll make a PDF available of this. Um, but the characteristics of gospel shaped friendships, they're truthful, they're transparent, they're, they're non deceptive, they're humble, they're mutual, there's sharing, there's respect. They enable us to be vulnerable and broken with one another. They're based on prayer, that they're loving, but they're non-sexual. 
They're based on respectful, non-coercive, non-manipulative. They cross the barriers just like the gospel. And they're transformative because the gospel changes lives radically and permanently. And they're filled ultimately with faith, hope and love. I mean, Stott had no idea what impact his friendship would have on my life as he did on, on all the other people he reached out. But he was motivated by faith, hope and love. And yet there have to be boundaries. Um, and here I came across a very helpful analogy which Jim Packer uses, the famous writer. He used it in his book, Knowing God. He says, you know, what does it mean to live a wise life? He said he used to think it, it meant you had some kind of sense, you know, like, like someone in a signal box who, who was able to see the entire layout of how life was and, and where all the points were and how to live your life. And he said, I've come to realize that's completely wrong. In fact, living a life of godly wisdom is like driving a car down a, around a twisting road that you don't know and which you have absolutely no idea what's coming around the bend. But you're an expert driver, so you know what the rules of the road are. You know when it's safe to overtake and when, it's, when you should cut back. You know when the camber of the road is the long way or where the surface looks unsafe or so on. And yet you're just continually improvising moment by moment as this new unexpected reality comes around the bend. And I think that's a beautiful description of, of what a healthy friendship is like. It doesn't go along, along very clear roles. You don't know what, how this friendship is going to develop, what the future will be, what, what unexpected uh, events in, in one another's life might happen. But we do know the roles of the road and we need to drive, we need to improvise creatively, but following the rules of the road. And the three rules of the road, these are the three boundaries um, within which all gospel-shaped friendships have to operate. And they exist in order to protect the integrity of the friendship and to ensure that as far as possible, the friendship is safe. In other words, neither person is at risk of coming to harm. And in order to protect friendships, they have to be non-sexual. These are the three boundaries, non-sexual, non-abusive, and non-exclusive. So when we see these boundaries being transgressed, those are the red flags that a friendship is going wrong. So for instance, if a sexual element enters into a friendship, uh, such as sexual gratification, fantasy, inappropriate physical intimacy. What we now know is that this can happen in opposite sex relationships, male-female relationships, but it can also happen in any same-sex friendship. And as I look back on John Stott and his generation, it's something that makes me smile because Stott and, and his generation were completely obsessed about male-female friendships and because then the risks that they might go wrong. And as a result, he was very strict about not being alone with a, with a, with a woman, even an older woman, you know, because of any possibility that it could be misinterpreted. But when it came to his friendships with other men, he was completely heedless, or at least seemed to be. You know, and he was quite happy to go off for days in, in the bush with other men and even sharing bedrooms and tents and all that kind of stuff. Whereas I think now we know that any friendship, whether it's a male-female friendship or a male-male or female-female, any friendship can become sexualized. And so we need to be alert to the possibility of a sexual element entering into the friendship. Secondly, is the possibility of coercion, abuse and control. And one of the things I've learned is that the greater the power imbalance between the two people, the greater the risk that there's going to enter in and a, and a, and a degree of emotional coercion. And of course, this is what happens in an intergenerational friendship. There is a power imbalance. I mean, John, when I first got to know John Stott and spent time with him, he was in his 50s at the absolute peak of his ministry. And I was a second or third year medical student um, and I held him in awe and it would have been very easy for him to abuse and manipulate that relationship. And yet he bent over backwards. I now can see 
how he bent over backwards not to abuse the relationship and how often when I would ask him for advice and say, you know, what do you think I should do, John? Should I do this? I should do that. He would say, well, now, my dear brother, I really feel I can't guide you. You must make your own decision before the Lord. You know, he, he, he wouldn't allow himself to um, manipulate or abuse the power that he had. So uh, the sex, the, the possibility of emotional coercion control, and then finally exclusivity. When fr friendships are not meant to be exclusive, uh, they are meant to be something that's shared. And when you have somebody saying, you know, you belong to me, I don't like you talking to other people, uh, you mustn't tell anyone else what we do together, you know, I expect total loyalty to me, I'm the person that God is using to, to guide you and help you immediately a red flag should be flying um, that that kind of exclusivity is, is a sign that a friendship is becoming unhealthy how does this kind of intergenerational friendship relate with mentoring and coaching and i haven't time to go into this in detail but when i did some background research much to my surprise i came across this realized that mentoring is a very recent phenomenon uh, certainly the use of that word uh, it, um, it has only started being used from the 1970s onwards and it comes out of a business um, context and so mentoring as it's described in business uh, is something that is task orientated it's hierarchical there's a mentor and there's a mentee and I'm the mentor and I'm here to help you. Don't ask questions about my life. I'm not interested in that. I'm here to help you. There are clear boundaries. We don't, there are some things we talk about. There are some things we don't talk about. It's time limited. I'm here to help you for a year, but after that you're on your own. And it's relatively exclusive. I'm your mentor. So, so what are you doing talking to this other guy? I thought I was your mentor. So in that sense, it, it's quite different from the uh, the friendship relationship that I've just been talking about and there's also a difference between friendship and pastoral care pastoral care again is hierarchical and unilateral I'm the pastor I'm here to help you uh, and you have needs which I'm trying to support you again there are boundaries in a pastoral relationship this is not really appropriate to be talking about my needs as a pastor and again, it could be time limited. I'm going to try and support you over this difficult period, but you know, it's, this is not going to be something uh, very long term. Whereas if we think about what I'm calling gospel shaped friendship, this is a friendship that's oriented towards the heart, not to tasks. It's non hierarchical, it's mutual reciprocal sharing. It's unbounded. I mean, talking to John Stott, I could ask him anything and he would he would talk honestly and answer. There was, it wasn't like there were boundaries, no go areas. Um, I think, you know, maybe there are a few absolute no go areas, but very few. It's non exclusive and it's not time limited. Yes, it's true that in some cases, friendships like this grow, they seem to reach a peak and then they seem to naturally wither away. But in other cases, these friendships are covenantal and lifelong. And I realized that I do have some friends uh, that we've walked together for, for decades and implicitly, although we've never said it openly to one another, I know that basically this friendship is going to last until one of us dies. And whatever happens to me, my friend Steve will be there for me. And whatever happens to Steve, I know that I'm going to be there for him. And um, it, it is effectively, we have entered into a covenantal lifelong friendship. Perhaps it's helpful, you know, I've, I've put the sort of perhaps caricature of these, these things. In reality, maybe there's a kind of spectrum between a mentoring relationship at one end and what I'm calling intergenerational friendship at the other. But I do think it's important to think about these relationships and to, and to make sure that expectations are clear. So if I'm desperate for friendship and I enter into this relationship with an older person, but they are thinking if as not as friendship, but as mentoring, then you can see there's likely to be uh, uncertainty and, and a mismatch and, and probably distress. So we need to clarify 
what the nature of our relationships are. We need to lay a foundation of teaching about healthy gospel-shaped friendships, mentoring relationships, and about the red flags that indicate when a relationship is going wrong. You know, when you read the stories of these abuse scandals, time and time again, Christian people say, well, I knew he was a, a godly man and, and I felt uncomfortable. And I thought it was a bit strange when he kept wanting to have these naked showers or whatever. But I just thought, well, because he's such a godly man, it must be right. And that's, that's why we need to lay the foundation. We need to teach people what a healthy friendship looks like and also what the red flags are. So to, in conclusion, building strong, healthy, committed, gospel-shaped friendships is an essential part of living and growing as a Christian. And one of the principal roles we can play as an older Christian is to seek out and nurture these kind of intergenerational friendships, but they don't happen automatically. They need to be nurtured, they need to be developed, and we need to reflect on our friendships, see them as high priority, and find ways of crafting and nurturing our friendships to become more gospel-shaped and more glorifying of Christ. Uh, so if you want to take these themes further, this is the book which came out just the end of last year, and uh, it's available uh, from all Christian bookshops. And I have a website, as some of you know, johnwyatt.com, and a podcast and a number of other books. But thank you so much for listening, and I'll go back to Peter. Thank you very much, John. We've got some time for question and answer now. So, uh, John, first question here. Um, it's, the, both questions are anonymous, actually, but the first one, thanks for your presentation. Do you feel there's a substantial difference, separate from depth, between, on the one hand, the character of intergenerational Christian friendship, which may be unequal based on age, wisdom, experience, differences, like Paul and Timothy. And on the other hand, the command or expectation to love uh, and not necessarily to like Christian brothers and sisters indiscriminately, which has a bit more mutuality or reciprocity in it. Well, I think it's a really interesting and important distinction. So as I reflected on this, I realized that all of us have brothers and sisters, biological, you know, we've got family, we've got parents, we've got um, children, some of us, and uh, aunts and uncles and all that, our biological family. And whether we like it or not, they are our relatives, and we have a duty to care for them. Sometimes we would dearly wish they weren't our relatives, sometimes, you know, but, but they are. And exactly the same thing happens in the church. You know, we have our Christian brothers and sisters and we have a duty towards them. And sometimes we would dearly wish I didn't have this particular Christian brother or a sister, but nonetheless, uh, I have, and I need to get on with them and love them and care for them. But friendship is different because friendship is all about choice. What's clear in the biblical understanding of friendship, for instance, Ruth and Naomi weren't forced to have a friendship, they chose, and so did David and Jonathan. And that's the beautiful thing about friendship, is that it depends on a kind of chemistry, on, a, on the free choice, and it takes two to tango. I might want to be friends with you, and if you're not interested, it's not gonna happen. But to discover that someone else wants to be a friend and, and to be drawn to them, to have this kind of chemistry, is a wonderful, beautiful, um, life enhancing reality and and i think that is the distinction between our brothers and sisters both our biological and our christian brothers and sisters and those who we choose to walk with hmm. i'm sure there are people listening to this broadcast today saying oh wow i would have loved to have a friendship with someone like John Stott, you know, maybe it would have transformed my life as as well, and but I never I never had that. And uh, you you talked uh, you you sort of hinted that that John was the one who initiated that that friendship, uh, and you talked about the intergenerational friendship between Naomi and and uh, Ruth, where where Ruth was probably the one who initiated in the sense that Naomi gave her absolute freedom to decide. Mm. Could, could you just talk to us a bit about you know, how one goes about starting a friendship 
an intergenerational friendship like this? Who who takes the initiative? Was there any kind of agreed parameters or covenant or whatever, or did, did it just develop naturally? Um, you know, talk to, talk us. I mean, how, how common yeah. in your era was that kind of intergenerational friendship, apart from the one that John Stott obviously had with many people? Just talk uh, us yes. around those. Issues. Yeah, no, thanks. Good, good question. So, so it is absolutely true that I had I hardly knew John Stott. I was I was going to All Souls Church. He was the rector. He was this kind of rather distant um, and, and slightly forbidding figure. You know, very impressive as a preacher. And uh, I'd, I'd exchanged a few words with him, hardly at all. And and then, much to my surprise, I receive a message: Would you like to come and have a cup of coffee with me? And I went in great fear and trepidation, feeling, you know, it was a bit like being asked to see the headmaster in the study and thinking, good grief, what have I done? And then <laughs> to discover that he was just saying, you know, tell me about your life and, and how, what's it like being a medical student? And, and how can I pray for you? What are you reading at the moment? And, and, and would you like to come bird watching with me? I mean, I was just... I was blown away. I remember walking away that first time and just pinching myself. I, I just couldn't imagine that someone like John Stott would reach out to someone like me. I now think, I know he was doing this with lots of other people. And I think most of the great Christian leaders of that generation were doing this. Mm, okay. I, I think it was just in their culture. Mm. But I think the sad thing is they never talked about it. They just assume that was what you do as a as a senior Christian leader. And I suspect that the next generation of Christian leaders that came along were activists. They were much more interested in, you know, forming denominations, church planting, running conferences, um, training, discipling. Um, and, and the idea of just spending hours and hours alone having cups of coffee with with non-entities like John Wyatt, medical student, um, would never have crossed their mind. And, I, and that's why I think that whole culture of Paul Timothy relationships and friendships um, became downplayed and, and, and to a large extent it's dropped out of our contemporary Christian culture. So I think, of, of course, Either party can start it. Either party can take the initiative. But I, I would strongly recommend if there are older Christian people here uh, and you would love to have more intergenerational friendships, that you take the initiative and you just reach out to individuals and, and just say, would you like to come and have a cup of coffee? You know, and, let's, mm. and then you just ask them questions. You know, you know, they don't want to hear a great long thing about your life and all you've done in your life but you know if you just ask people how can i pray for you or what's it like and you know what are the issues you're facing at the moment people love to talk about themselves they love to talk about their life and and to somebody who's genuinely interested and concerned and will pray um i i think that's that's the way to do to take the initiative and to cross the pain barrier because of course when we do this we are opening ourselves to rejection yeah, well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, actually, I don't want to come and have a cup of coffee with you. <laughs> You're the last person I want to have a cup of coffee with. You know, so so we are making ourselves vulnerable when we reach out to another. But that's what love is all about. Love is about prayerfully saying. My sadness is I never asked John Stott later in life how he did it, how he chose who to reach out to. And I suspect it was a combination of um, of spiritual discernment with a kind of intuition. He 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 did have a sort of intuitions about people and and those who he thought would be responsive, people who 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 would develop a deep deep friendship. And interestingly, as I've talked to the other friends of Stott, I realised that all their friendships are different. It's not a kind of one size fits all. Uh, it wasn't like he had some kind of program, you know, what, what, let's read the Bible together. Let's start at Romans 1. You know, what, it wasn't like that at all. It was much more informal and, um, and, and sharing his heart, uh, reaching out and, and wanting to treat each of us as an individual. Hmm. Now, you talked about uh, these 
uh, friendships being non-exclusive. I wonder if you could unpack that a bit more, because non-exclusive might mean, um, you know, only ever meeting together, uh, the two of you, and not with others. Uh, or it it might it might equally mean uh, having only one of these kind of friendships, uh, unlike what you described with John Stott, where he had a whole host of people. Yeah. Like, what What do you mean by uh, non exclusive? Yeah, it's a good it's a good point. I th and actually, I think it's both of those that you just said. So so what comes out in some of these abuse scandals um, is that the abuser tries to isolate the the um the younger person so the kind of things i said like i don't want you talking to anybody else about what we're doing here you know this is entirely between us um mm -hmm. i want you to be completely loyal so so um one of the abusers apparently when this young man appeared and it was actually staying in the vicarage mm -hmm. the the man met him at the door of the vicarage and said there are just two rules about you coming to live in my house, and they are one, total loyalty, and two, you laugh at my jokes. And I now know that was a red flag. <laughs> uh -huh. that, that should have straight away said, well, why does this person demand this kind of total loyalty? What is there going on here? So it's this kind of isolating, we've got this special relationship, yeah, I've been given by God to, uh, to lead you. And I don't want you talking to other people. I don't want you having advice from other people. You're mine. It's that kind of grasping. That's the red flag. Whereas genuine, and of course, the same thing happens in marriage. We all know that a healthy Christian marriage depends on faithfulness. It depends on exclusivity. And if we are the as soon as there's an element of sexual unfaithfulness, that is enough to destroy the relationship. But friendship mm. is not like that. So friendship, actually, when I discover that someone else was a close friend of Stott, I don't think, oh, I thought he was my special friend. <laughs> In fact, what I say is, it's not wonderful. You had that same experience too. You know, so it, it, it isn't that kind of clinging on it's much more sharing um and in fact it grow as we share friendship it actually grows it's one of those strange paradoxes of human relationships mm. now uh of course john stott was your pastor and um th there's a question here do you think pastors or vicars are more guarded in developing friendships with people in their congregation because of mistrust of motives of those keen to befriend their pastor and vicar. And uh, you talked about the difference between a pastoral relationship and a friendship as well. I mean, how, how does, how do we negotiate that? A pastor's off limits. Uh, well, I think this is a really complicated one. And, the, and uh, because as I was doing research about, on my book, I had a very interesting conversation with an older um, Christian leader who was all of the same generation as John Stott. And he's, he said, when he was the rector of another church, he was very conscious of not having a kind of favoritism, you know, mm -hmm. that it could be seen if there were particular members of the flock that he had a close friendship with that could be um, misinterpreted and could lead to all kinds of difficulty. And interestingly, although Stott was the rector when he first reached out to me, he rapidly became rector emeritus. Mm when he was no longer the official head of the church. And it was really only after that that his ministry of friendship took off. Okay. So I think he was sensitive to that. When, when you are still the church leader, you have to be sensitive to the possibility of misinterpretation of, of close relationships. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think that rectors and church leaders sometimes use that as an excuse not to have close friendships. And I know, and I can think of church leaders who've told me, well, I, I, I'm the rector, I can't have close friendships. You know, I can't, it would be quite wrong for me to share any of my problems. And I think that's just wrong um, mm. because they don't want to make themselves vulnerable. 
So I think that every church leader does need some very close friends in which there's confidentiality, in which they can be vulnerable, they can share their struggles. Um, but you do need sensitivity. And yes, there is a difference between the pastoral relationship, which is hierarchical, and mm. the, um, the friendship, which is genuinely reciprocal. Mm. John, you've talked very helpfully about the three red flags, and uh, you you talk that often the first awareness is just a discomfort that you feel in the relationship. And uh, two people have actually asked the same question here, uh, Rosemary Prudhoe and Terence McQuiston. They're both saying, if you're in a situation where you start to feel uncomfortable in a friendship, then uh, how do you negotiate that should you distance yourself if so how do you raise the issue with the person do you talk to others talk us through that yeah and it's a really again good question and there isn't a simple answer i think the first thing to say is how serious is the problem i mean that's why this this concept of spiritual abuse is helpful even though it's controversial because by towing this word abuse what would mean is that actually you can have permanent lifelong damage mm. um and so if you're in a situation where you think actually there is abuse going on here either it's happening in my relationship with this person or i'm aware of it happening somewhere else then you really do have a responsibility to um, contacting the person who's responsible for safeguarding. So one of the good things now is that in every church and in every organization, there is a named individual, there should be a named individual who is responsible for safeguarding. And, and therefore, if you feel that there is, this is a really something reaching the level of abuse, then I think you have a responsibility to reach out to that person and just be honest with them, tell them what's going on, tell them about your concerns and then ask for their wisdom because they are trained to respond. If it's less serious, but nonetheless, there's a kind of red flag. I think you have to turn to somebody older and wiser who knows both you and the person. Find someone else who you trust, go to them privately and say, look, can you just advise me? I just feel uncomfortable. I can't really put my finger on it. There's something about this friendship that feels wrong. What do you think? What would you advise me? How do I go? How do I respond? I think that would be my advice. Find someone with life wisdom and, and sensitivity, someone who you trust and discuss it with them. Talk, talk, talk it through. And um, yes, if, if this is something that is causing damage, then I think I have to withdraw myself. But but then I, I've got to think, well, what about the other people? Who else mm. is, if this person is, is, is crossing red flags or crossing the boundaries, then I've got some duty to them too. And, and, and that's why I think I have, do have to talk to somebody and ask their advice. Mm. Now, the examples you use from the scriptures were all same-sex uh, relationships. And uh, you talked about John Stott's wariness of opposite sex relationships. Is there any place, do you think, for intergenerational opposite sex friendships? And if so, what, what would be their character? And you think of any biblical or uh, Chris, historical Christian examples uh, of whatever? It's, it's an interesting topic. And... Um... When I went round and talking to people, this was often the topic that came up. Yeah, okay, we can see same-sex <laughs> relationships. What about male-female friends? Surely, you know, surely. That. And what I discovered is there's a complete generational divide here. If you ask yeah. anyone over the age of 50, do you think that a man and a woman could have a sort of close friendship, you know, but it's non-sexual? People say, ooh, ah, I'm very worried about that. No, I think this is, it's bound to go wrong in the end. If you ask someone under 40, they'll say, of course, what's the problem? You know, it's it's um, in other words, there is a huge generational shift here. And if you think mm -hmm. about it, the problem is if you say, well, only men can be foster, uh, can befriend men and only older women can friend. Oh, you know, what you're saying is all the you young women who would love to have someone to guide you and help you and talk to and, and have some kind of father figure tough can't exist. The only possible chance is get married. 
If you can't get married, you can't have any kind of male friendship, which is ridiculous. Uh, so I do think that with the right kind of protections, the right kind of understanding about boundaries, yes, it is possible for older men to have close friendships with younger women, and it's possible for younger, for older women to have close friendships with men. But we've got to understand on each side what the risks are. We've got to walk in the light, and we've got to uh, try to ensure that the evil one doesn't lead us astray. But, you know, mm. take a same-sex attracted a man who is trying to live a celibate life. Would you say to the man, well, the one thing is you mustn't have any friendships with, the, with other men because they could get sexualized. So you could only have friendships with young women. You know, we think that doesn't make sense. It's certainly not the advice we give to same-sex attracted men. So mm. I think we've just got to understand that all relationships can be sexualized but provided we walk in the light it is possible to have genuinely healthy non-sexual friendships across the genders sadly we've virtually run out of time i did want to ask you one more question before we let you go but we could go on for this for with this for a long time because there's a lot more questions but um and i, I know that you know moved by john's example you you yourself have intentionally developed intergenerational friendships. That's part of your burden. Um, but I wanted to ask you, that there was obviously a huge uh, advantage for you in uh, your friendship with John Stott and the others who had friendships with him. What do you think the benefit is to an older Christian in the same uh, in the same way? What, what, what do you think John if you'd asked John, you know, what, what do you think he would have said about the intergenerational friendships that he had in terms of how they you know, benefited and blessed his own life? You like? Yeah, I, and I think it's quite clear that actually he did benefit. In fact, he did write a bit about this. He said how much he learned about the modern world from the, the close friends he had. And often he would, he would ask me, you know, what's it like to be a medical student? What are the big issues that you're facing? You know, what, mm -hmm. what does your generation think about this? What, what? Mm -hmm. So he used us as a way of understanding the modern world. He, mm -hmm. And I came across this lovely phrase, perhaps you should finish with this, an exercise uh, that a, a strong intergenerational friendship is an exercise in time travel. I am learning to see the world through the eyes of someone in a different time. And it works both ways. The younger person is learning to see the world through the eyes of somebody who's older. And the older person is learning the eye to see the world through younger eyes. And it's, it's a two way benefit. And it's the way that God made us that we should be learning, constantly learning more from both from older people and from younger people. Mm -hmm. John, thank you so much. It's been really, uh, really interesting and enriching as well. We're, we're just really grateful to you and to all of you who've joined us today on ICMDA webinars. May the Lord bless you and we'll see you again soon.